Wednesday night. It is more or less eight o'clock. It is more or less Mac to the Future Go, the live cast that never ever has things that go wrong. Huh. I'm wondering whether or not there is audio. Can anyone hear me? I hope so. Anyway, um, I guess you'll let me know in a minute. <laughs> the um, last weekend was amazing for uh, those of you who are watching this. I didn't know. Uh, I took my wife to South Carolina so that we could see the um, uh, the eclipse that was that kind of wound its way through the United States, and it was a combination uh, birthday present because her birthday was earlier in the month. An anniversary present because our anniversary is coming up uh, on the 29th where it'll be uh, 20, 25 years that she's put up with me. And it was not easy to get the time off from work because this is the time of year when we're all, you know, as far as our organization goes, we're trying to settle our budget for the next fiscal year. And it was like an all hands on deck kind of thing. But I was able to get just that Monday off, the day of the eclipse. So getting just that day off meant that um, I had to be back that night. You know, there was there was no choice in the matter at all. So um, we got in the car Saturday morning. And we drove all the way down to Richburg, South Carolina, which is where the hotel was that we were staying at. And the original plan was we were going to go to Columbia, South Carolina, which was like another hour to the south from where we were. It was the closest hotel that we could find that was, um, oh, let's see, you know, our, uh, hey, Frank, are you at least hearing me? You know, are you getting, are you getting audio? Of course, if you're not getting audio, you can't hear me ask if you can hear me. So I'm going to ask you here in the chat room, is audio coming through? So I guess we'll, we'll find out here in a minute. Yeah. Facebook does hate me. Uh, so we, we got down to Richburg. Okay. So Warren is getting audio and video. All right. Well then I don't know what else I can do. Um, so we, we, you know, after we checked into the hotel on Saturday, we drove down to Columbia and we started scoping out some of the places there. There was a couple of parks that they were having like planned events. And then we started kind of checking the weather and according to the weather, uh, Columbia was going to be really, really cloudy. So we started looking at some other options and we found this small town that was like just to the west of, um, uh, Richburg called Newberry and they had all kinds of stuff going on there. So we, we drove up, uh, the interstate until we, we got to Newberry. And as soon as we drove into the place, found a place to park, parked the car, of course, uh, started looking around and this was like the quintessential small Southern town, really, really nice people. Um, they, they kind of really had their, their act together as, as far as the, uh, eclipse was going to go. They already had like a storefront set up and they had those, those cheap paper eclipse glasses that they were handing out for free to people. They weren't charging anyone for these eclipse glasses. Uh, there were already some, some food trucks that were set up. There was a custom t-shirt place that was set up. And at that point, I guess they were all just kind of waiting to um, see, you know, what the weather was going to be like and how many people were going to show up. And the official count, I think, was over 30,000 people. So we got there and we walked around. We got there real early. So we were able to park relatively close. And um, as the eclipse started, we had some we had some special glasses that I had, I had purchased on Amazon. They were hard plastic, not just the paper ones. So <laughs> Eclipse gets started and you now we're watching it through the glasses and there were lots of people there. I mean, if you, if you Google 
uh, Newberry Eclipse, you'll see some of the pictures of the site and, and the way that it looked and, and the way the eclipse looked from that location. And as you got closer and closer to the eclipse itself, um, a couple of really, really cool things happen. And, you know, you read about these things and you, you know that they're going to happen, but when it actually does happen, you're, you're kind of like kind of blown away. Um, it started to get darker, which makes sense. However, it wasn't, at least to me, the kind of dark that you would see as the sun goes down. Uh, the light changed, but it didn't look natural. It was an, kind of an, an, an eerie light. And um, probably 15 to 20 minutes before totality, the um, all the bugs came out. Uh, not you know, not like mosquitoes and stuff like that, but you could hear uh, cicadas starting up like they do at nighttime, and it got really really loud. Even with everybody kind of cheering as as the uh, the sun started to get eclipsed by the moon, and then that last ten to fifteen seconds. Now, even with just a little tiny sliver of the sun that wasn't covered by the moon, you still couldn't look at it uh, without those glasses on because it, it would just totally blind you. But the moment that the moon totally covered the sun and you had the, the, the ring that went all the way around it and everyone just started cheering. And for the next two and a half minutes, we, we, we're watching something, you know, I've, I have traveled all over the world and I've seen the pyramids of Giza. Uh, I've gone to Mayan temples in Mexico. Uh, I've been to uh, Petra in uh, Jordan, uh, walked the streets of Jerusalem. You know, I mean, I've been to a lot of places. I've been on the Great Wall of China. None of that. And, you know, those were all amazing. Don't get me wrong. But none of them compared to just the sheer spectacular of, of the eclipse as it was happening and as totality hit. And uh, originally, I didn't want to go all the way into where the totality was happening, thinking it was going to be too crowded and all the rest of that. And my wife talked me into it, and I'm glad she did because um, – I haven't seen a site like that ever, ever before. And uh, I'm going to get off this topic because I'm sure you're all bored, bored to tears listening to me talk about it. But if you've never seen a total eclipse, and I'm not talking about um, on pictures or video or, you know, any of that, or people talking about it like I'm doing here, it doesn't compare to actually seeing it live. Um, it is something that you should put on your bucket list. I know there's another one coming in 2024 that's going through uh, the United States, kind of a north to south thing. If you can go, don't miss it. Um, it's it's something that you should experience. Um, you know, I, I am looking forward to um, 2024 when it's going to happen again, and I'm going to find some way somehow to to be wherever it is that's going on okay um i didn't take any pictures of the eclipse um i didn't take any video because i really wasn't set up to do so and uh maybe next time i will but at this point at, with the, the kind of schedule that we had with the eclipse all i wanted to do was be able to get there have a place to stay see the eclipse and manage to get home that night which we did because I had to be to work Tuesday morning. Um, we didn't get in. It took us like four hours just to get out of South Carolina. But by the time we finally got here back to the house, it was like 2.30 in the morning, which made going to work the next day at 7. Not a real fun experience. Um, but yeah, yeah, I would, I don't, I don't regret it at all. And if you can see one, go, go, just go and see one. Okay, getting off of that, a couple things I wanted to talk about tonight, and uh, I've got something that I saw in Facebook that I'm going to talk about as well. 
Uh, but the first thing that I wanted to talk about was um, if if you if you weren't aware of this, you should be because if you have a good backup solution, these kinds of things can affect the decisions that you make regarding your backup solutions. In this case, um, it was a company called Crash Plan who has this, you know, you download all your <clears throat> you download all your stuff to them and they hold it on their servers and if you ever need it, you can re-download it. Uh, they'll also send you uh, a hard copy of it if if that's something that you want. But the um, I guess the whole point of it Whoa, what ha happened? There we go. Oh, I thought I lost my, my OBS there for a minute. The whole point of it is to have an off-site backup. So your house catches on fire or your computer gets stolen along with all of your, your hard media. Uh, well, y you don't have to worry about not having your stuff because your stuff is there. However, not if you are if you're using CrashPlan or not relatively soon if you're using CrashPlan. Because they are shutting down their consumer subscription model to focus on the enterprise and small business plans instead. So if you're on the home plan, you won't be able to renew your subscription. And anyone who's on the current plan, uh, once they go past the official shutdown date of October 22nd, 2018, uh, you'll be switched to their small business plan until that subscription runs out. Now, Crash Plan got some dust there. Crash Plan recommends using Carbonite for their existing customers. Uh, I've been using Backblaze for uh, the last couple of years, and I'm I'm pretty satisfied with it. I think it's like ninety nine dollars a year. Uh, but the thing is, any hard drive or any data that you have on whatever computer you select that you want to back up to their service. Now, in my case, with this Mac Pro, I've got uh, four internal drives, or really three, since I use one of them for a backup for my main data drive. Um, I've got a couple other drives that are hanging off of it. I mean, I had have uh, a lot of stuff, and that includes my iTunes library, which is, you know, almost it's like two and a half terabytes or more all by itself, which reminds me I need to get a bigger hard drive to put in there because my I think I've got like less than 500 gigs left. So Crash Plan is, is shutting their business down. And <clears throat> there is or was a, a, a plan with Amazon where they offered unlimited storage. That's also gone away. And what we're kind of, I think what we're kind of seeing here is the inevitable shakeout of cloud services as they become a little bit more mature. And um, some of these companies find out that whatever their original plans were weren't sustainable at the, the levels that they had them. And some of them, like Crash Plan, instead of going ahead and saying, "Okay, well, we're going to raise prices so that it's it's profitable to do this," uh, are just going to say, "You know what? We're we're making more money with the enterprise and small business than we are with the home plan, and so um, we're just going to concentrate on that instead." And you know, I mean, that's that's their business. If that's something that they want to do, that's that's okay. It that's kind of up to them. But it's something that you should think about, but you know, not only before you select a service like this, but you need to think about it in terms of what are you going to do if suddenly, for whatever reason, that service goes away. And it's not the first time that these kinds of services have gone away, where you, you're suddenly scrambling to figure out what to do. Um, sound, for example, SoundCloud, which is a service that a lot of podcasters use to store their audio. Uh, they're, they're having lots of financial problems right now. And, you know, they've managed to keep their doors open. But if you store all of your audio with a service like this, and you don't have any backups of that audio, well, if they shut their doors, you, you'll never get it back. So you, you need to have, you need to have plans for, 
these kinds of, of services that don't reside where you live, where you don't have all of your stuff backed up to a hard drive that you can lay your hands on physically, like, like this. So think about it. Have, have a, a, a backup plan for your backup plan. Uh, whether it's it's the stuff that you keep here in your house, you know, I've got I've got three backups, and you know, one of them is completely offsite, Backblaze. I have two ba regular backups here. Actually, I guess it's four because then I also have for a couple of the drives here in the Mac Pro, I also have a Time Machine backup. But have you know, have an idea of what it is you're going to do if things don't go the way that you expect them to with some of these companies. Uh, let's see. Oh, Melissa. Oh my God. How are you? We got the Mac mommy is here live. Well, sort of, I guess I'm the one that's live. Mac mommy is with us here tonight. I haven't seen you since uh, Mac stock. It's so great to see you all. I hope you and Nate and the kids are doing well. I, I know that you've been sick. You need to get back on over to, um, Oh damn! What's the podcast you do? Uh, I know you do a couple of them. Tell me, and and I'll I'll give you a shout out right here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Frank Petri lost three years of podcasts when he let a subscription lapse. Yeah, that can happen. Uh, Warren Sklar says between iCloud Drive, Dropbox, Google Drive, and Time Machine, we shouldn't need to pay for a service anymore. Um, it that kind of depends on how much storage you have and how much stuff it is that that you consider to be important uh with a lot of the cloud services and, and you you know you mentioned them here like google not so much google drive but uh if if you're a big user of google docs you know you don't really need to store probably um a lot of these uh documents that you've created locally because google will keep them for you um but in in order for me to, I mean, I had six terabytes, I think, maybe more of data that I backed up through Backblaze. In order to get that kind of storage with iCloud or Dropbox or, or some of the other ones, it would have been quite pricey. So, you know, I'm, I'm reasonably happy with Backblaze. Um, if Dropbox... And a few of the other ones are the ones that, that make you happy. Well, then certainly use those instead. Um, I like I like having Backblaze keep all my stuff and uh, having the option to call them and say, well, just send me how X number of hard drives, however many it takes to, to, uh, to fill up with all my stuff and send it to me. Uh, in touch with iOS. Yes, uh, you and Dave are trying to record. Oh, you're going to record on Friday. Good. Um, and, of course, you're also doing the, um, oh, gosh, darn it, geekiest show ever with um, Kevin and Elisa and other people that come and go. Mike, Mike, um uh, Mike McPeak, not Mike McPeak. I can't, oh, I'm so awful with names. One of the, one of the many, many fun benefits of, of getting older, though I have to say it is better than the alternative of not getting older. All right. Um, next subject that I want to talk about before we take the break. And when we come out of the break, we're going to talk about something that, uh, Ed Benton shared, uh, just earlier today. Now, if you use a lot of Apple's pro apps like Final Cut, Motion, uh, Compressor, Color, and other apps, if you have the older versions, older versions of these, Mike McPeak, yes, thank you. Oh God, if you have the older versions of these apps prior to them being sold in the Mac App Store. What you're going to find is with High Sierra 10.13 that these apps aren't going to work anymore. Apple is moving on. And so I guess it shouldn't come as too big of a shock. It's been 
four, four or five years since uh, Final Cut Studio made its way over to uh, Final Cut X or whatever they're calling it now, which I don't use. Um, I'm reasonably happy with uh, Adobe Premiere Elements. It pretty much does everything I wanted. I wanted to do. I that's what I use to to transcode this uh, this live cast to put over on YouTube. But if you are using those apps, 10.13 is going to put you behind. So if you want to keep continuing to use those apps, you, you have a choice to make. You're either going to have to stick with whatever the last version of the operating system is that those applications still ran and ran well, which means, of course, that you'll need to... Um, keep track of security updates and things along those lines. You know, basically if you're using older apps with an operating system that is more than one or two gens back, you probably shouldn't use that computer online anymore because you won't get the security updates and you won't get some of the benefits of uh, newer versions of the operating system. So it's, it's something to keep in mind. Eventually, of course, um, you will have to move up. Don't you won't really if you if you're using these apps professionally, that's that's just kind of kind of what's going to happen. And you know it it does suck because these aren't these aren't inexpensive applications. Um, I actually bought Final Cut Studio in Chicago, as I recall, and it was like seven hundred dollars, eight hundred dollars, something along those lines. And within a year. I believe that the the App Store version came out and I basically at that point just moved away from it. You know, I, I had used Final Cut Express for a while, if you guys remember that. That finally stopped working altogether. And uh, Adobe does their own little thing, especially with their Elements programs. They update them and then they stop working. So, you know, that's Adobe's plan to get you to update their applications. Uh, either that or you go to their subscription model, which I refuse to do. Once, If they stop selling um, Elements, uh, uh, not, uh, Premiere Elements. God, I'm so, having so pro many problems with my brain today. I'll probably just go ahead and switch to another video editor. Uh, over in the chat room, do you remember Mosey? I tried it and it ruined me for trying to use a service like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Melissa is also talking about the iPhoto to Photos transition. That's that's something. I'm guessing that um, iPhoto probably will not work with 10.13. Um, Apple works to iWork. Yeah, same kind of thing. You know this. There's, there's really not much you can do. Um, in Apple's case, I don't think it's about making more money because they have plenty of money. And yeah, they like making money. Uh, I think it's just more a question of not wanting to support older versions of the program and trying to keep their operating system lean and clean enough to where you know, the call-ups and everything else that they needed for those older programs, they can, they can kind of get rid of. Anyway, that's, that's what I think anyway. So uh, we are going to take a little break. If I can get to my, there we go. If I can get to my, uh, my ads that I have premium, I need to make some new ads because I, I basically have Ed's book and the MyMac ad. And I thought I had one for the Maltese Cube, but I don't see it. Don't see it at all. So I guess I'll just do the one with, uh, with Ed's book. Be right back. Ooh. Are you a new Mac user or an old hand? Wish you could know the ins and outs, keyboard shortcuts, or hidden tips and tricks to make you more efficient using your favorite computer? Hey, it's your lucky day, because Edward Eisen has written a great guide to knowing more about the Mac and the OS that it runs on. It's called 
This is The Light Side, and it's available through Apple's iBookstore or with Amazon. Better yet, it's not a stuffy old book that gathers dust on the shelf once the next operating system is released, because it's an ebook that you can look at any time you want. It won't get outdated because it's continuously being updated. Information on setting up your new Mac, installing and getting rid of applications, security settings and what to look out for, keyboard shortcuts, some basic app recommendations, how to use Windows on your Mac, if you really want to, that is, advanced topics, searching, using iCloud, and much more. All this for a mere 99 cents. Go to the iBookstore or Amazon and check out Edward Eisen's This is the Light Side. It's the book you want on your virtual shelf. Okay, we are back. And something I forgot to mention just before I, I left on my trip to, uh, to go see the eclipse. I went to, I, you know, as I want to do, went on eBay and I love microphones. As Melissa can tell you, I have a plethora of microphones and, and this is the one that I just picked up. This is the, see if I can turn it around here. It's the Sen, ah, come on. It's the Sennheiser E835. This is a, a dynamic microphone. And uh, I'm, I've been kind of testing it out uh, up against my, my lovely little Heil PR40. And the, uh, the other one is the Electra Voice... Uh, ND, you see it? ND767A. And I don't buy these new. You know, I find them in pawn shops and I find them on eBay and um, all kinds of stuff. I love collecting microphones. And as I was kind of doing a comparison between the Electro Voice one and the Sennheiser one, the thing that I found, and I still haven't kind of made up my mind because uh, right now, in my in my travel gear, I don't when I travel, I don't take these these big uh, high old PR forty microphones and the and the whole boom and all the rest of that. It, that's just way. It, I, I'm carrying too much stuff now as it is. However, uh, as far as microphones go, uh, the mic my microphone of choice right now in my travel kit is the Audio Technica uh, AT. 2100 uh, XLR USB great microphone because it has both USB and XLR. And depending on, you know, you can go, you can basically take these microphones and even if you don't have any kind of interface, connect them up to your Mac, make an aggregate device and combine them all together to, to send a garage band or, or, or wherever. Um, but I do carry a lot of that stuff. So I'm I'm looking at getting either more of the Electro Voice or of the uh, the Sennheiser ones. The Electro Voice is about two hundred dollars per, whereas the Sennheiser is only about a hundred. Big difference between them is how much gain is required for either one of them. Um, the Electro Voice needs a little less gain, however, it is more subject to background noise though it's not that bad because I mean, these are both dynamic microphones. So I will be testing them and, you know, eventually I will, I will make up my mind and, and pick up at least, you know, two, maybe three more of one or the other. And yeah, I guess cost is kind of a, kind of an option or something to figure in with this as well. Uh, but that isn't what I actually wanted to talk about for the, the, um, uh, the last part of the show tonight. Um, actually, actually, there's a couple comments here. Frank Petri says, "Been there, bought it." I'm guessing you're you're, you're talking about the Sennheiser because you you go a little bit farther into that. Um, another microphone that I haven't tried. I know that Behringer makes uh, a couple in that same price range as the Sennheiser, and they make it a slightly cheaper one that's actually very reasonable. 
the 1800. Uh, I don't know if you've used either one of those. You know, I would really, really like it if some of the music stores in the area had some way for, for people to test out microphones before they bought them. But they're not going to do that. Not as long as there's there's um, pawn shops and eBay and a few other places to make take your gear that uh, that you either can't afford anymore or don't need anymore. But the thing I wanted to talk about before we close the show out tonight, uh, Ed Benton shared this with the group and it was a story that was on MacRumors.com about the AccuWeather iOS app. And MacRumors had this story and the title was AccuWeather for iOS sending location data to monetization company, even when location sharing is off. Now, what they don't explain in the title, it is explained somewhat in the the meat of of the story itself, but this is kind of misleading because it's not like AccuWeather or this monetization company is is hacking iOS and turning on location services even if you have it turned off and frankly if if you're using a a lot a weather app it's kind of important that the weather app knows where you are so that it can determine what the weather is in the area that you are currently so why you would turn location services off for an application like this doesn't make any sense. But there are people that go ahead and do that and then constantly put in the location of where they're at when they want more accurate weather where they are. And that's that's fine. I don't get it, but that's fine. What they were actually doing is looking at the um, the Mac address of the device that the application is on, and uh, the I guess the Mac address of uh, whatever uh, modem or service, whether it's Wi-Fi or what have you, that the device is connected to, checking the database, which would give them within a relatively short sp- you know space of of as far as location goes, uh, where the person was at the time that um, the application was starting to check all this. This is something that any application can do. You know, I mean, it's not a secret. And things like your MAC address of... Well, yeah, Melissa says turning off location saves on battery. And yeah, it does. Um, But, you know, I'm speaking more along the lines of of people that um, constantly check weather. And there are some people that are obsessed with it. But there, there really isn't any way that I know of to be able to turn off things like the MAC address of the device that you're, that you're, that you have the apps on or the MAC address of the device that you're communicating through. And, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious from these sources, basically where it is you're located at, but some people get really upset by this. Um, Warren Sklar called them bastards. You bastards. Uh, Chase Griffin said he stopped caring about this stuff uh, a long time ago, man. It's like this kid does nothing but go between school and his house, uh, Paul Burt said he stopped caring about weather apps also a long time ago. He used to use the Yahoo Weather app. Then Apple absorbed or emulated it, and he's only used uh, Apple's ever since. Uh, Ed Benton said he kind of liked the AccuWeather uh, hour by hour. He would be willing to pay for it, uh, but he wouldn't because they are doing surreptitious tracking. Uh, Paul Burt says Apple does this hour by hour for the next 24 hours. Ed Benton uh, agreed with that. So was saying goodbye to the AccuWeather uh, app anyway, since Apple's does pretty much the same thing. Kevin McGinnis says it's disgusting. Then I came in and uh, asked 
basically, you know, I didn't really quite understand the story that it, what actual information can be gathered if location services are turned off. Um, if they were still able to get the information related to location services when it's turned off, then shame on them. But, uh, but shouldn't also part of the blame be on Apple for whatever loophole was used? Something about this story seems off. And that's, that's kind of, you know, I was kind of right. There was something off about the story. Um, then Stephen Gray came in and said, as he understood it, the app is passing the router, Mac address, and SSID to third party where the information can be correlated with public info to derive approximate location. So no GPS data is involved. The app is using a sneaky workaround to get the user's position. Um, I don't know how sneaky it is. It's, it's, you know, this is all common public information. Um, I didn't like the story, not because they were giving information to a third party. I didn't like the story because of the headline and, you know, trying to make it out to be really a lot worse than it was. Like it was some kind of super uber hack that AccuWeather was doing to go against the wishes of their users and Apple when all they were doing was just looking at information that gets transmitted every time you use your phone. Okay. That's my take on it. So if you would like to get a hold of me, you can do so. Uh, I can be reached at guy at mttfgo.com. Also G Searle, the number one, uh, gmail.com. I am Mac parrot. Mac. On the Twitters. And I can also be reached via our Skype telephone number, which outside of the United States is one or plus one. Uh, in the U.S., it is area code 703-436-9501. 703-436-9501. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for being on or for coming and listening to me yammer away once again. Mac to the Future, Go Livecast, episode 23 is what this one was. Uh, before I go to sleep tonight, I will have this posted on YouTube and more than likely have a link to that YouTube video here on Mac to the Future. Uh, for those of you who watch via YouTube, the only way you can look at this live is to join us here each and every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Mac to the Future Facebook page. It's real easy to join. All you have to do is not be a flipping troll. You know, be a real person. That's all we ask. I don't think that's too much. I don't think that's too much at all. I really, really don't. So thank you all so very, very much for being here. And um, I will be here next week. I will probably be very, very tired. Because this weekend, I'm, you know, last weekend I wasn't on the MyMac podcast because I was taking my wife to the Eclipse. This coming weekend, I'm not going to be on the MyMac podcast because I'm going up to Boston to get my son Guy. And we're going to, you know, he's, he's moving back down to here. Chances are Saturday night, um, there is, you know what, I need to, I'm going to look up something real quick here over on the the Googles and I need to bring up a map of Brighton because I think that Saturday night we are going to be at this dive bar that guy my son guy was working at uh, as a bouncer and I just can't remember the name of it but I will find it and I will tell you. And I hope that, uh, that he and I will be there. And if you live in the Boston area, there is absolutely no reason why you can't come and join us for a drink. Uh, we've tried this before. <laughs> it, it has never worked out uh, as far as, as meeting up with people. Uh, the name of the place is The Last Drop. It's at 596 Washington Street in Brighton, 
uh, Massachusetts, 02135. Um, that's in the Boston area. It's right off of the, the Boston Mass Turnpike, I think is what they call it. So, But that's probably where I will be for at least part of Saturday night. And uh, I hope to be able to see see you there if you live in the area. That's assuming anybody sees this and, and you know gives a crap enough to, to come see me at a bar in Boston. <sighs> anyway, uh, thanks again, everyone, for being here tonight. And I will see you soon.